2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, we have these words. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Good evening, church. We're in the middle of a gospel series looking at the identity in Christ and characteristics that, of the identity that we as Christians are to have. So far, we've looked at being a warrior with Brother Brian. His words were, we are to use, we're to use the war manual from God and not follow the world's war tactics. From there, we move to Brother Michael with the citizens of the kingdom. How there's friction between our Christianness and, in our, in our case, our Americanness, and how we must choose our primary citizenship. And then, Brother Shane with You Are Saved. How our actions and how our attitude and whom we serve, the light that we emit. These are important characteristics of a Christian. And tonight, we're going to focus on, in my opinion, the most difficult aspect in our series, at least it has been for me, and perhaps the one that's the most challenging, the most uncomfortable, the most demanding, and the most inconvenient. As Christians, and part of our identity in Christ, you are a sufferer. I'm very thankful that you're here tonight. I'm thankful for the opportunity to share some thoughts from the Bible. And I want to be the first to say that I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to hurt or to be let down or to disappoint. But friends, it's guaranteed to happen. Christians are called to suffer. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Has the first century definition of that changed? We read how early Christians suffered. We'll look in Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 58. In Acts 7, beginning in verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, speaking of Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This is suffering. We read in that great faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 35. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Folks, they were, they were cut in half. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. This is suffering. Then we read of some of Paul's sufferings that he records for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, and often without food, in cold and destitute, in exposure. And apart from all other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. This is suffering. Yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'll ask again. Has the first century definition of the suffering that we shall experience changed? Look around the room. Do you know anyone in the room tonight that's experienced any suffering that the ways that we've read? I haven't. And I confess, I haven't suffered anything even closely related to anything that we've read so far. But I'm so very thankful that we are blessed in this country with freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And perhaps that's some of the reason that that I haven't experienced sufferings like this. But there's still a part of me that questions if I'm doing this Christianity thing right. So there's a number of ways that, that we may suffer in this world. There are those who suffer directly because of sin. For example, if I go on a, on a drunken binge or I'm doing illegal drugs and I drive my vehicle, if I have a wreck and I'm seriously injured or, or killed, or I choose to shoplift and I get caught and I'm arrested, or if I have such fits of rage that I just, that I just can't control myself and, and I get into a fight with someone and I hurt them or I kill them, There's a great deal of suffering that comes as a result of my own sin. But perhaps maybe I'm not the one that's sinning, but rather I'm forced to suffer indirectly because of someone else's sin. Perhaps I'm just driving home from the grocery store and, and that drunken or drugged person swerves their vehicle into my lane and we crash head on. Or someone breaks into my home and steals precious keepsakes or maybe I'm, I'm that guy that, that tried to help someone, and for whatever reason, they snapped on me, and they hurt me, or they killed me. I mean, there's a great deal of suffering that comes as a result of others' sin. And there are those who, who suffered simply because of random chance. Natural disasters, or, you know, tornadoes, or floods, or, or major ice and snowstorms, and we've And we've suffered that, and we've dealt with that here locally very, very recently. Major sicknesses, or perhaps all the suffering that's been been caused and continues to exist because of this current virus. Or maybe the hurt that I experience from watching someone else suffer with the sickness. Or maybe just being at the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's just simply a matter of chance. The world experiences these types of things, the ungodly and the godly. So what's the difference? In Ecclesiastes, we see examples of the wise and the foolish. And in chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes, down in verse 2, we have these words. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 2. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. The choices we make in life or what drives us down the paths of life. We can look all around us and we can see the injustices, and we can see the unfairness, the cheating. We can see the consumption of the world around us because of sin. And that's just the way it is. So how is a Christian, how is a Christian to be different? If I'm told that as part of my identity in Christ is to be a sufferer, how does that make me any different than anybody else in the world? How am I different from from anything else that's going on? Well, it's because of an understanding. Again, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, 
The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. It's this understanding of my roles and my responsibilities that makes my suffering different. It's that understanding that relates us to a New Testament teaching in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, uh, we'll start in verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. Seems we kind of have the right to suffer. Continuing in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the, cre- of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails and pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. The world has has been succumbed to these sins and these sufferings for a reason. And it's for hope. As a Christian, when I suffer, do I see, excuse me, do those around me see the way I react to those sufferings and understand that I'm different? Do they understand that I'm different because I'm a Christian? And based on those Christian values and my persona and my characteristics and the things that I demonstrate and the way that I carry myself and the way that I handle any suffering that that comes across me, do they understand that I'm different Because I don't place my hope here. I don't place my hope in this world with all of the injustices, with all the unfairness, with all of the hurt and the pain and all of this temporariness. But I base it on the hope to come. The hope in the Savior. The hope that God sent His Son Jesus to die to provide salvation. Do those around me understand when I suffer that I act differently? Hopefully, Hopefully, as Christians, we act differently. And it's based upon that hope. Now, we all suffer in different ways. And we've seen seen from previous examples of some, some very intense suffering from the early Christians. But we, here in Somerset, Kentucky, United States of America, today, in the year 2022, we don't necessarily suffer like the early Christians. But we could easily have a government that creates a great oppression. I'm thankful we don't. But we do suffer. We will suffer in any way that we choose to carry our cross. This cross is not a display of, hey, look, I'm a Christian. Look at me. Look look how good I am. Look, Look at what I'm able to do. But rather, it's a constant reminder of the death and the suffering that we must carry as a new Preacher. And that applies to us. We may suffer from our faith based on, on, on relationships with our family. We see in Matthew chapter 10, verses 35 through 39, that, you know, that, that, that we may be segregated. I just may be pushed away by my family. Or sometimes I, I may have to push my family away. I may have sufferings from co-workers or from the community based on how verbal I am on the stances I take as a Christian. And friends, these are, these are no little things. These are big things that impact others in phenomenal ways, in ways that I just may not understand. Someone's physical suffering. Just for one example. Someone that's been sick for so long and has been ready to pass from this life for so long, why are they permitted to stay here on this earth and to suffer the physical pains and all the mental anguish? 
Why are they permitted to suffer? Those involved in, in this picture understand how powerful it is to sing praises to our God for someone on their deathbed. Why are some permitted to suffer? It may have absolutely nothing to do with them whatsoever. It may, however, have everything to do with how I see them dealing with that. Their suffering may influence me in such a way that it ignites a, a zeal in me that's been buried for so long. And what can you say about someone suffering with that kind of influence? To God's glory for His people. To God's glory. Let me ask you a question. If I squeeze an orange, what comes out of it? Orange juice. Yes, yeah, orange juice. Why? Because that's what's inside the orange, right? You, you don't squeeze an orange and get apple juice, ever. You squeeze an orange, and you get orange juice, because that's what's inside. So relating to the lesson, as Christians, what comes out when someone puts the squeeze on us or treats us badly? What comes out of us when we're under stress? When things don't go as planned? When our friends or our children or our spouse, or co-workers, or fellow Christians, when they disappoint us? What comes out when we're betrayed? Or when we're checking out at the grocery store and our debit card is declined? Or when we're left out of conversations or opportunities because we're quote-unquote too churchy? What comes out? Is it anger? Is it sadness or depression, or frustration, or fear, or revenge? The thing is, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced all of these things and many others, so what does that say about me? What does that say about what's inside of me? Here's another question. What came out of Jesus when the world put the squeeze on him, when he was mocked, when he was beaten? and when he was crucified. Literally, there were tears and blood and water. But there was also strength and heroism and compassion and sorrow and resilience and gratitude and love and forgiveness. There was peace and acceptance just as we can learn what's inside an orange when it's squeezed, and just as we can learn more about who we are when we examine how we react to the challenges that we face and to the sufferings that are put upon us, we can learn more about Jesus by reflecting on what came out of Him during the most intense period of His life. Though Jesus seems passive throughout, throughout His passion, you know, He ever lifts a finger... Um, against anyone, and he, and he barely speaks. His acceptance, his forgiveness, and his nonviolence is revolutionary. And it provides first century insight on how to live justly right now. We can see this in how he reacts throughout the events that lead to the cross. And here are just a few examples on the board behind me. In Luke chapter 22, beginning of verse 39, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, with the weight of the sins of the world upon Him, what does He do? Jesus prays. In Mark chapter 14, beginning of verse 53, when, when Jesus is condemned by the Sanhedrin, when the very ones that should have known who, who he, that He was the Christ because of all the prophecies, when they mocked him and they condemned him, he was steadfast. In Luke chapter 22, 
Beginning in verse 54, when Jesus is denied by Peter, when one of his closest friends lies, he denies, and he steps away to hide in the distance, Jesus accepts others' weaknesses. In Luke 23, beginning verse 27, when Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem on his walk to Calvary with the cross on his shoulders, he thinks of others. In Luke chapter 23, beginning verse 39, Jesus promises his kingdom to the, to the good thief, if you will. While hanging and bleeding on the cross, he hears the repentance of the thief beside him, and he forgives. In John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, Jesus speaking to his mother and the disciple that's with her, as Jesus is about to accomplish his work and, and, and he nears physical death, he looks down from the cross and he watches over his family and makes provisions for them. As Jesus responds to his sorrow, he's expressing to us the best of what it means to be human. From these actions, you know, there are no miracles here. There are no sudden healings. There's no casting out of demons, no parables. If this was the first time that, that you've ever read these passages and not known anything else about the other Gospels, you think that this is just an ordinary person, someone who's experiencing loneliness, heartache, and pain, and exhaustion, and ultimately death. He's no different from any of us. Yet there's something extraordinary here. And we can see that in how Jesus responds when the world puts the squeeze on him. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't whine or feel sorry for himself. No, rather he, he counters the blows. He counters the torture and the mockery with elegance and love and forgiveness. He shows us what it means to truly be human. And friends, this is greatly significant. We learn so much by seeing how others react to their sufferings. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, but we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who, but, excuse me, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If, if we're thinking that, that I can handle it, I can handle it. I'll just get through it in my own way, in my own time. Let me tell you, you're wrong. Lots of horrible things happen to the New Testament Christians, and I pray to the Lord that, that we'd never have to experience anything even closely related to that. But for the sufferings that we do have to deal with, I can tell you that we should face them just like we read in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Friends, these are sufferings. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In verse 37, no, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I say amen to this. For all the pains 
all of the disappointments and the sadness and the discouragement and the fights and the sicknesses and the wars and the pandemics and all the fallen Christians, as bad as all of that hurts, and it does hurt. It cannot separate us from the love of God because our faith is in Jesus and it's not in any of these other things. And we have assurance, according to John chapter 16 and verse 33, the words of Jesus, He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. But take heart, and there's the hope. I have overcome the world. So brothers, sisters, friends, those that have never been baptized into Christ, who or what are you placing your hope in? Life is going to kick. And life is going to kick hard. And it's going to try to keep us down. That old devil is going to use every tool at his disposal to cut our ties with Christ in hopes that we will wallow in our own sufferings and our own sins and be overwhelmed with discouragement and overtake him with the cares of this world. Do not, do not let it happen. We've been given all the help that we need. Spend time on your knees in prayer and ask for strength. Be close with your church family. Do things together and support each other. Have Zoom prayer meetings over family issues. Get your kids involved, helping others who are suffering and trying to adopt. You know, there are those suffering from loneliness. Go visit. Go sing to them. Have singings at nursing homes during the holidays. Or, or begin regular nursing home visits where you can sing praises to God together. And there's so many, so many other ways. Spend time alone studying your Bible, searching out and clinging to the hope. Look around. I mean, spend time with those striving to go to heaven and be vulnerable with them. Be vulnerable with your issues and ask for help. We are all sufferers. But if we're suffering as a Christian, don't be ashamed of it. In 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, but rejoice insofar, uh, excuse me, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. As you're squeezed, give the glory to God. Grow through it. Help someone else and shine brighter than you ever have. Again, I deeply appreciate your attention, and I hope this has been beneficial. As I mentioned at the beginning, this has, been, this has been a difficult lesson for me. But I would like to end with the beginning. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he had committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
as Christians, we shouldn't be trying to figure out why things happen. Why things happen the way they do. Why am I dealing with all of these issues? Why is my family rebelling against God and causing pains and causing issues? And, and why are all these seemingly bad things, why do they keep happening to me and all I'm trying to do is follow Jesus? We don't respond to trouble, to sufferings, to inconveniences, to trials, to temptations or random chance to the unfairness, or even the consequences of, the, of sin the way the world does. We follow the guidance in this book, in this book alone. In Romans chapter 12, we're told to be transformed, to be different than the world. And through prayer and support and study, we grow through our issues, keeping the hope that is set before us. And understanding as we read in James chapter 1 that if we do it the right way, if we do it the right way, we will overcome. We will be better. We will be stronger. And our faith in that hope will have increased. As a Christian, if I've been ashamed to suffer and to carry my cross, and somewhere along the way, I decided to take the easier path. I've not shown my, myself different from the rest of the world in, in, in my examples of suffering. And I've even possibly influenced others to make the same selfish choices that I've made. Now is the time to change. Refocus. Recommit. Reignite your love for Jesus that compels you to live for Him. Come up front and acknowledge that. Admit to yourself and admit to God that you've been choosing foolishly. And let the church here pray for you. Let her embrace you as a brother or a sister. Let her love you and let her help, you protect, let her help to protect you. If you're here and you haven't been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, why not? There's so much grief and sorrow and so much pain and suffering in this world to help us realize that the only true hope we have is found in Jesus. He is the only one that we can put our trust in that will provide peace. Again, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, the words of Jesus, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. If you're ready to be part of the family of God, ready to accept the hope and the peace that's only found in Christ, and ready to wash away the old man in, away in baptism and put on Jesus and accept your new identity in Christ, now's the time to do it. Come now.